So these, these two projects, um, both have won, have won WAFX awards. Um, and I was saying earlier, we saw such good ideas this year that we didn't really want to distinguish between, let's see, let's say the two projects we just saw, which are very, very different to make one a winner and one not a winner. So we've been more generous with our WEFX awards this year, and I think quite justifiably, um, because um, I was trying to say, well, what have those projects got in common with each other, other than the fact that they in involve a reuse? Because one is from a very um, kind of sort of engineering data new world perspective. And the other one, although it's taking into account carbon and climate, is coming at this thing from a kind of, you know, a landscape, urban design, um, city sort of perspective. Um, and I wonder, let's, let's start off with with Arup, because Arup kind of does all sorts of things everywhere. Do you think that that kind of engineering take on the world also applies in the sort of urban schemes that you do? Or do you think that this, the North Shore rig is a very particular thing? I, I think the, the approach applies also to the urban landscape, definitely. Um, the data center, in the specific, to stay in the topic, of course, this is a very specific project. It's based on trying to use a structure that otherwise is very hard to find another function because it's far away from society and the urban landscape. But data centers are going to come closer and closer to the city, so it could be embedded in the project as well in the future as we need more and more data for all the things we need on a daily basis. Yeah, because one of the things about your project is the amount of energy that's used and therefore mostly at the moment carbon generated in the powering of data sensors. I think I saw it's, a, it's like 10% of total energy consumption in the world. Does that sound right? Yeah, it grows by the minutes, doesn't it? I mean, uh, de definitely there is an, in the project, there's in the intention of, of using the location of the data center on the oil rig for two purposes. First, to create energy using re renewable energies such as the wind, uh, tidal waves, energy, and the sun, but also you know, using the wind of the North Sea to cool the data center, which is also a cause uh, of energy consumption in this building. Thank you. So turning to um, Barcelona and this amazing Mercedes thing, um, I'm guessing that probably 20 years ago, you might have approached this project without the energy overlay. In other words, you'd have looked at it as a piece of urban design, as an opportunity for public realm and landscape. I remember, for example, the first year of World Architecture Festival, we, we had a student charrette, which was based on the old Viella shirt making factory, um, just outside the, the, the city center. And I remember going around that, and it was, you know, wonderful modernist, kind of industrial uh, buildings and the students I think were asked to, to add a swimming pool <laughs> to the complex, whatever it might become. But energy, although it was important then, it wasn't the kind of consuming thing it's become now, but quite clearly informing your kind of landscape and urbanistic wor work is a very heavy emphasis now on what does this mean for carbon, climate and temperature. When did, this, when did this sort of change start to happen? Hello? Hola? Ah. Okay. Uh, well, we start to think what well, our office try to, to, to mix the landscape or the nature with architecture since like so times ago, no? But it's true that in the world, no? Uh, thinking about energy or thinking about consumption or demands is more like the, maybe the last five years, four years, no? It, it becomes to be a tending topic, no? Uh, concept, no? Uh, especially in La Mercedes, it, it was very important to think about energy and we change our mind of uh, urban design or urbanistic design, changing some concept of this con of the urban design thinking for for example in the intelligent underground no thinking of this intelligent underground j just to share the energy solar energy renewable or heat and cooling energy 
we, we want to share it together. No? So it's very important that this becomes no, one of the main points of this master plan because we have to put it, this in the master plan and also in the urban design no, to be approved in the council. Because this is, this is so interesting to me because it's this thing about whether, whether you're forced to change your urban design and landscape architecture principles to take account of concerns about carbon and climate or whether you use the carbon and climate just as a driver to generate as, as it might be a driver, could be finance, could be client demand. And that business about whether you're having to change radically in ways that you wouldn't otherwise have changed. Because my sense in, in your work is that, is that you synthesize these questions of man-made and nature. And therefore, taking on board another element like that doesn't mean you have to change your principles, but it may change the design and, and the outcome. But I, I think, but I think it, it, it has changed our principles. So the point is that maybe in this transition from, from this change of perspective, at a certain point, we were thinking, OK, we will do the same, but, but maybe in a more sustainable way. No? But the point arrived when we saw that sustainability was a driver of design. And then you were thinking first about how to achieve this sustainability, how to make a responsible use of resources. Maybe resources, when I say resources, can be resources, existing resources, an existing building, it's a resource already, and we can get advantage of that. But also, the energy we want to consume is another resource, or the, or the rainwater is another resource. And the point is how we deal with these resources in order to get the optimal use of them, and then changes the way you design radically. And, and the good thing of that is that we think that maybe we are in a historical point, like we had 100 years ago with the modernism, that will bring us a new image, a new conception of how we design and how we approach. This time, not because there are new materials in the table, this time because there are new sensitivities on the table. Yeah, this is very interesting. And that sort of crossover point where actually a new thing makes a significant difference to the way you think about everything. I mean, in a way, the history of Arab um, was coming at that, that sort of thing from a different angle, which was right from the outset when the architectural practice was formed, it was the extent to which engineering ideas and ideologies, you might say, were actually changing the sort of architecture uh, that the practice was producing. Now, at the time, it wasn't about carbon because we didn't really know about carbon, but it did have quite a lot to do with energy, didn't it? And, this, and the relationship between the, the kind of aesthetic design of buildings and their functionality from an engineering and mechanical and electrical servicing point of view. Yeah. I, I think that as architects at Arup, uh, we've always been influenced by you know, the fact that we work uh, uh, with engineers, uh, and especially so our team, which is a, uh, a completely multidisciplinary team. So we have uh, all type of engineers, structure, MEP, and all the specialism. So that really drives a different approach, because it's not the architect meeting the engineer once a week or once a month. It's like, we design the buildings together. Uh, that, I think, makes a big difference. Even more so in this context. We were t I, I totally agree with what uh, they were saying. We need to design starting from the idea of sustainability, circularity. It's not something that we can design a building and then we stick so, on, on top some green wall or something like that. It's a bit more complex than that. So in that sense, integration with engineering is paramount, I think, for the future. And can I ask a technical question about those oil rigs? I mean, what is their anticipated life in, in, in the ocean or in, in, in the sea? Will they go for 100 years? Does anything happen to the structure that, that is predictable? So uh, as far as we know today, what happened to the structure, as I was saying earlier, is that it, it gets encrusted with this marine wildlife. So it becomes like a new habitat, but apparently doesn't get damaged so there's a long foreseeable future for the structures. 
um, we, are, we are still witnessing, you know, is the, is the, we are the fir first oil rigs that we are decommissioning. So possibly 50 or 100 years. So, yeah. Now, Mercedes, you had to deal with um, a slightly different condition, which was existing industrial buildings. And there's often a dilemma about the condition of those buildings and whether, uh, whether, whether as they say, whether the, um, whether the juice is worth the squeeze. <laughs> And I wonder whether that was a situation at Mercedes or whether, in fact, the buildings were in, in pretty good condition. Well, as it, is, it is a factory or a car, it was a, fa a car factory. The structure is in a, good, in a very good condition and it can um, have a lot of heavy weights in it, no? Because, for example, the, the university, now that we're transforming a vertical factory to a university, Obviously, the structure of a, fa or a factory can support a lot of weight, no? and the university is not necessarily the, these heavy weights. The condition of the structure is in a good condition, and one of these intelligent things that we add is, for example, in the old production plan, transforming to a, to a new plaza. No? Transforming to a new plaza when opening, we are destroying the roof and just leaving the structure. So this is better for the structure because it was maybe the most delicate area and, but when we destroy the roof and we open it you know, to, the, to, the, to the sky, we are taking away all these loads of the snow or the wind, you know, because it's just a structure. So we are maybe conserving the heritage, but we are like making less heavy or less problematic you know, of the weight of the snow and the heritage. So also this new adding of the, of the plastic was intelligent you know, at, that, at that point to, to conserve the structure. Yeah, and, and, and also what we want to achieve with that, when, when we were saying at the end of the, of the, of the explanation that it's important to, reno, to renew the, the existing cities, is because then we can explain the history of the city. So we, want, we don't want to, reno, to make one part of the city brand new. For example, in this case, in this plaza, we will be able to explain this was a factory, this was La Mercedes, in fact, with the name of the neighborhood, we are trying to achieve that. No? So, so, and this gives character to our cities because there is history. There are, there are layers of history there that can explain to the citizens and to the community that they belong to this place, to this history, to this, to this structure. No? A structure that was before for cars and now it's, it's for the greenery, no? for, 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 for make the greenery expand uh, towards the plaza. No? Well, that, that district is, is going to be fabulous for the residents because most of them won't ever have been into the factory when it was in industrial production, so it's a huge bonus for them. What about the people on the oil rigs? I mean, how many people are going to be... If, if these data centre conversions um, happen, are they people-intensive or is it, is it occasional visits? They're not people-intensive. That would be most likely 50 people, 200 people for each oil rig converted to a center. And they will have to be staying for short times, so obviously, because it's in the middle of the North Sea. So, so there's a sort of conventional kind of hotel room program on, on the rigs as well. Well, the idea is that could be embedded in the data center rig or in a, in a standalone oil rig that's dedicated only for, let's say, staying purposes and eventually, you know, scientific studies purposes, any other use that can go on the side. Now, because, you, because you've won prizes in this reuse category, I wanted to ask you that if you're doing a, a brand new project, uh, do you think about, well, you know, I've been asked to design an office or a sports center or, you know, a hospital. Do you think about, well, if we had to reuse this in 30 years' time, um, what can I do to make that reuse easy? Or is that just too speculative a, 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 a question? I think, I think it, it makes sense that now when we design our buildings, thinking about the, taking advantage of the existing things are important, but also designing in terms that this can be flexible for the future. No? Uh, some weeks ago, no, my client who is here, for example, uh, asked me for, a, for an office building. And in, in the first meetings, they, they told me, OK, and now explain me how this will be able to be changed to make some uh, dwellings, for example. 
And, and this is the type of questions that make sense nowadays. I mean, we are in, in, so, in a so changing rapidly environment that somehow we have to understand that buildings are not just here for five, 10, 15, 20 years. They are here for 50 or 100 years or more. And since our society is changing so fast, we need to make these buildings able to adapt to the types of changes that, that will be required in the future that we don't know yet, for sure, and it's, impo it's impossible to know them, but we have to think about this level of flexibility. Yeah. If I may add uh, on this concept, I think we are the first generation, possibly, that design building not only for the intended use, uh, but also for any future possible use, uh, because uh, we have a different sensitivity about what's going to happen in 50 years, 100 years from now to what we build and we design. So this uh, goes both in two ways, in my opinion. One is thinking about potential reuse, so designing flexibly, but also circularity in the use of materials. So a building could be reusable, but could be also demountable, for example, and reused and rebuilt somewhere else as something different. Uh, we make a mas another master plan like seven years ago to a company in, Barce in Barcelona or close to Barcelona and, and we don't take care about the existing buildings or the existing site and we just propose a uh, like classic urbanism uh, of expansion of the city where it was the factory of this company and we just destroy everything and we do the and now they make a competition to do the office buildings and after seven years, we change it, and we change. We have we, our competition says that we have to change another time the the urbanism of the city to maintain, no, to conserve the heritage of the production plan. So it's what you say, no, that sometimes we change our mind, no, in these seven years, and we m understand that we make some maybe problematic decisions in the past, no, like destroying the, our heritage, and now we are like we want to change it, no. Well, I think that's a very positive note to bring this session to a close, actually, because I think when you, when you get a kind of um, uh, architectural uh, movement or feeling that we're doing one thing here, but as a consequence of what we're doing here, we're changing what we're doing there without being asked <laughs> um, and bringing that up as a possibility to begin with. Because we have long thought in, in the UK that the, one of the most sustainable things that planners could do is say, if you're doing a new building, is to demand to see an indicative design about if this building isn't this or that, what else could it be? And if it can't be anything else, what it means is it may be a good example of you know, a hospital but it's only a good example of hospital architecture. It is not a good example of architecture. No generosity. And I think the, um, the, 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 what certain designers have realized is that let's say you design a shopping mall that becomes redundant. A shopping mall could be quite a good medical center. Um, all those dark spaces that are useful, atrium, probably some parking, obviously some shops, quite useful in hospitals these days. But then the problem becomes, this is impossible to convert because the cores are all in the wrong place. <laughs> now, if somebody had thought, well, if we're designing this, why don't we think, supposing we wanted it to turn it into that, what would we do? That's right, we put those cores somewhere else. And it might be slightly less efficient for the first use but it's going to be far more efficient for the long-term um, life of the building. So, you know, these are the thoughts that have, th that's reminded me about that from this session. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and I'm going to give you your trophies now. Um, I don't know if um, we've got a photographer here, so that's nice. So let's do the little ceremony. Just one, no? Yeah. Oh, one. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay.